Christy Artuso. I'm the Regional Director for Professional Practice, Education, and Research. So it's a mouthful. In reality, though, my background is I am a critical care nurse. I was a critical care clinical nurse specialist on the East Coast and then again in Alaska. I've been with Providence for about 12 years and have enjoyed my time with Providence tremendously. And I've worn a couple of different hats. But on the East Coast, before I went to Providence, I served a critical care unit as a clinical nurse specialist. We were a large unit, but we also had an arm that was critical care obstetrics. And that was a fascinating opportunity. We were a large tertiary care center, uh, about 360 beds, so not huge, but university affiliated. But one of our major services was high risk obstetrics. And so we were known throughout the state of New Jersey as one of the top centers in the state for high risk pregnancies. And so the case that I'm going to share with you today is not one of the cases that we had, but it's a case that I was actually hired to review and then to testify in court. And so I spent um, quite a few hours testifying on this case as an expert in shock and an expert in sepsis, as well as critical care obstetrics. So I want to share the case with you because it's a fascinating story about a young woman who had her fourth pregnancy. So let's go through this case. We'll talk about what we're going to uh, look at as far as objectives go. We're going to look at three major categories of shock. And the reason we're focusing on shock itself in a lecture that's really going to highlight some core information about sepsis is because shock is simply a descriptive term that looks at different causes of total body failure. And so it's a term that we use to describe different symptoms that you will see. Sepsis is one of those causes of shock. And so we're going to be talking about the physiologic changes that occur in the body. So we're going to do a little bit of anatomy and physiology, but we'll talk about those changes within the context of what you would see as a staff nurse when you're caring for a patient who has one of these issues. We're going to talk about the subcategories of distributive shock, and I'll define that in a little while. We're also going to talk about the clinical sequela, what you'll see, how it progresses, and what you should do about what you see. So first and foremost, we're going to look at our case study. And our case study is about a 35-year-old woman who's gravita 4 para 3. She is 40 weeks gestation and admitted for induction. Of labor. Her prior deliveries are uneventful, and everything I'm giving you, first of all, we've disguised a bit of it so that there's no possible way that you would ever figure out who this patient is. Second of all, this is from a state that I've never worked in, so you can't even look at my CV and figure out where this was. So understand that, and I've made some changes to the case. The actual foundation is the same, but there are changes in demographics so that you would not be able to figure out who this is. Um, prior deliveries were uneventful. And the newborns themselves ranged in size from seven and a half pounds to nine pounds, eight ounces. So fairly healthy sized infants, no problems with pregnancy, no documented complications at all. So this is all very important information. And remember, I reviewed this case as an expert, but also reviewed it from start to finish. And how many of you have talked about a football game on Monday morning? You know, we always know better than the quarterback did, correct? So the reality is armchair quarterbacking or Monday morning quarterbacking as we often call it, is easier because you have the whole picture. And so for me, looking at this whole picture, understanding how the outcome was, it was much easier to pull the pieces together. However, it's invaluable to review cases as a way to learn about different concepts, as a way to look at what happened and how we can avoid similar things happening in the future. Her past medical history was relatively benign. She had a cholecystectomy at one point in time. She had a colonoscopy with the removal of a few benign polyps, so nothing serious. During that pregnancy, she would had a flu-like syndrome that was treated, and she responded very well. Her prenatal screening was completely unremarkable. She did not have any gestational diabetes, even though she was a bit overweight. I think I didn't mention, but it was on the screen, that she was 250 pounds and about 4 feet 10. So she was an obese woman for pregnancy. No prescription medication and no allergies. So all of this paints the picture of who your patient is. Early in her admission, she had an artificial rupture of membranes and started on intravenous pit. She delivered a 10 pound, five ounce baby girl. Labor was not prolonged. It was not extremely difficult. All of this is clearly documented. The nursing documentation essentially during labor and delivery is unremarkable. Nothing unusual in that nursing documentation. She does sustain a second degree laceration, not surprising given the size of the baby. EBL is 400, so totally within an expected normal 
EBL for vaginal delivery with second degree laceration. Everyone agree so far? Anything that right from the bat you would be concerned about with this patient based on what information I've given you. Okay, nothing really concerning. So during labor and delivery, and I want you to pay close attention to these vital signs. During labor and delivery, her blood pressure ranges from 136 to 74 to 144 over 78. Her heart rate averaged 91 during active labor. Her respiratory rate is documented at 20 throughout. Now I want to call your attention to that respiratory rate. How many of you have actually attended a mother in labor? <laughs> Most of you. Okay, 100% maybe. Does anyone breathe at a rate of 20 during the transitional phase of labor? Yes or no? No, not so much. But yet it was documented at a rate of 20. Now I'm highlighting that for a reason. You're going to understand later the exact reason, but early on I want you to realize that it was fairly obvious when I looked at the vital signs during labor and delivery that some of them were less than accurate. In fact, I would go as far as to say that I believe that the people taking care of this patient actually made up the respiratory rates. They didn't count them. Because it's not possible to have a respiratory rate of 20 during transition. It's not possible during active labor to have a respiratory rate that doesn't change ever. But that's somewhat of a judgment call until we get further into the case. During the recovery, her pain is documented actually at 6 to 7 on a scale of 1 to 10 throughout labor and delivery. I'm okay with that. It's a subjective number. If that's what she said it was, we'll, we'll accept that. During recovery, her vital signs range from 125 over 85 to 130 over 70 with a pulse rate of 65 to 100. And again, a respiratory rate of 18 to 22. It doesn't change at all. And so the reality is, I want you to look at those vital signs and kind of remember the approximate range because it becomes important. About six hours after delivering this baby, at 10.15 that evening, the patient received Tylenol number 3 for pain at a level of 6. She was complaining of abdominal pain, pelvic pain, and they medicated her with Tylenol 3. Now, we're not going to debate whether this was the right medication to give or not, but just understand she had pain and they medicated her about six hours after delivery. At midnight, her temperature was 101.5. Now, why does that number concern me? Anyone want to guess? Why am I concerned about 101.5 at midnight? It's two hours after you gave her some Tylenol. It's two hours after I gave her Tylenol. Tylenol is an antipyretic. It is not an anti-inflammatory. It is an analgesic and an antipyretic. Tylenol drops the fever, all right? It works to decrease temperature. And so two hours after, when the Tylenol is peaking, her temp is 101.5. So what I realized at that point is her temp is not really 101.5. It's actually higher, which is a significant concern in a patient postpartum for that few hours. So this is not a dehydration temp, this is a real fever. At 4 a.m., so now we're about six hours after that initial medication, her temperature is now 100.4, so a little bit lower, but her blood pressure is 96 over 66 and her pulse is 135. Why does that concern me? We're gonna go back to those original vital signs. Yeah, her blood pressure is down significantly from her baseline. Not a little bit, but significantly. She's obviously awake, so you can't even argue the fact that, well, she was in a deep sleep when we took it. No, and I'm assuming that over the course of the past 24 hours, she slept at one point or another. We never had a blood pressure that was anywhere near that. And her heart rate's 135, and even during labor and delivery, her heart rate never went above 100. 100 was the highest. Well, okay, so you say she might be bleeding. I think that's a good point. She could be. But right now, we see low blood pressure, we see an elevated pulse rate, and of course her respiratory rate is still at 18. <laughs> I'm just calling your attention to that because it just doesn't change in this patient. But you're going to see why that's important. The next morning, so now we're another morning after, she continues to complain of persistent pelvic pain, lower abdominal pain, with and without movement. The physician, the obstetrician, says, I think she has a separated symphysis pubis, orders radiology film. Radiology film is unremarkable, does not diagnose or confirm the suspected diagnosis. And so they continue to treat her for this separated symphysis pubis, and the note in the chart states, not always visible on radiologic examination. Now I'm not, I'm not going to dispute that it's not always visible, but if you don't have a definitive diagnosis and you have a patient with pain, you need to do some other test to confirm that, that non-defined diagnosis right? Mm -hmm. 
and they did not do any further tests. They documented that as their diagnosis of choice. We're going to continue to medicate. But here's the other thing that bothered me. This pain was with and without movement. Usually a separated symphysis pubis is going to have more pain with movement. And it really didn't change. She continued to complain of pain even lying in bed. And so that didn't make sense with that differential diagnosis. Over the next 48 hours, she was prescribed Vicodin, Tylenol-3, Toradol, Demerol, and Ibuprofen. And she was medicated with these medications around the clock in varying intervals. So she was given Tylenol-3 if it wasn't effective. Two hours later, she was given Vicodin. Four hours later, she was given Ibuprofen. So she was literally being medicated with various medications that were analgesics, antipyretics, and anti-inflammatories around the clock for another 24 to 48 hours with no real relief. Again, I would be concerned because what we're doing is not effective. And so there's always something good to keep in the back of your mind. If what we're doing is not effective, maybe we're not treating the right problem. During the second day, based on your question, they did an H&H &H because they said, well, maybe she's bleeding. Right, low blood pressure, tachycardia. Not sure that the pain, the pain might or might not go with that, but the H and H was normal. Non-hemorrhagic hemoglobin and hematocrit. CBC? They didn't do a CBC. Mm -hmm. What's well, her channel? So white. Why? They didn't do a CBC. So I don't know what her white count was. That would have been a good idea at the time. They did an H and H only, and in fact, the nurses asked for a CBC and were told it wasn't necessary. Yes. The patient's condition continued to deteriorate over the next 24 hours, so I realize this is a longer time than we normally see a postpartum patient in the hospital, but she's not doing well. She can't really ambulate without pain. She's on significant medications. Her vital signs are not essentially stable. There's something going on. They don't know what it is. They've not really done enough definitive diagnostics to determine what it is, but she's not discharged that third day. She stays in. But she becomes severely hypotensive, persistently tachycardic. Her heart rate stays in the 130s, 140s, 150s. And she does spike another temp on day three, significantly higher, 102, 103, 104. She deteriorates. She requires vasopressors, so medications to keep her blood pressure up. She is intubated. Her respiratory status fails. She's placed on a respirator. They send her to the cardiac cath lab. Now, I love this one, and people that have heard me do this lecture before know that because I looked at that and said, you did what? Why? That's what I said. The actual documentation in the chart was, we suspect a congenital heart defect. And I said, don't you think it would have reared its ugly head on pregnancy one, two, or three? <laughs> I mean, congenital means you're born with it, right? And so it doesn't disappear for a few years and come back. The reality is, they didn't know what was going on with her. They thought they would do a cardiac cath to see why her cardiac system was failing. Well, it was failing for another reason, and I'm going to show you why. But the reality is, she did not have a, card, a cardiac um, a congenital heart condition. She had clear coronary arteries, but her pump was definitely failing. And so she was placed on an intraaortic balloon pump and then antibiotics 72 hours later. So let's go on and talk about shock. And then I will give you the outcome at the very end. So shock is basically a condition. It's a term that describes a condition that basically summarizes all the systems in the body failing. They don't fail at the same speed. They fail differently in different people. But there are some things that you can clearly see that will help you understand why this happens. And it happens for different causes. And the reason that we made the decision to focus on all the causes is because there are some that you will see. Regu not regularly, not frequently, but you will see them here. Not just the one that this case is focused on. So it's a process that eventually will cause the shutdown of every body system. And when that happens, the outcome is pretty much predictable and it's not good. But I like the analogy of the slinky. How many of you know what a slinky is? You know, as the years go by, I'm going to get fewer and fewer hands. <laughs> so trivia, this will, win you, this will win you the trivia game anywhere you go. Holidaysburg, Pennsylvania is a small town in western Pennsylvania where I was born and raised. And it is the home of the original slinky. The only slinky factory in the world was in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. So uh, I like the analogy though because a slinky starts out a little bit wider and then it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And it describes nicely the progression of shock. Shock starts out very subtly, very slowly. And you begin to see some subtle changes in your patient that may not always point to a clear picture.
But as the process speeds up, it becomes faster and faster and faster and faster. And you get to a certain point in the shock syndrome where there is almost a point of no return. And in fact, at one point, there is no return. And so as shock progresses, your mortality rates go up very rapidly. In the beginning, it's 100% reversible. So I want to tell you that the outcome in this case could have been very, very different. So eventual circulatory failure, what did I say? Her heart failed, that's why she went to cardiac cath, leads to cell hypoxia and eventually death. So a couple of things I want to define that are important to understand because as you evaluate what's going on in the human body, you can understand why these changes occur. We normally have a mean arterial pressure somewhere between 80 and 95, 96, give or take what our base blood pressure is. Mean arterial pressure of 60, all right, so it's calculated, is what it takes to maintain basically minimum body functions. All right, we need that amount of pressure within our blood vessels to perfuse all of our organs. That's the minimum. Usually it's much higher. When your mean arterial pressure is between 60 and 130, which is what we consider relatively normal, 130 is on the high side, but it doesn't mean that your, your systolic and diastolic are that high. It depends how it calculates out. But anytime your mean arterial pressure is within that range, your vessels actually auto-dilate and constrict to keep it there. It's called auto-regulation. It's one of those magnificent features of the human body that works really well. So basically, my body knows that I need a blood pressure of X and a mean arterial pressure of Y, and it's going to automatically dilate or constrict my blood vessels to keep it there. It's auto-regulation. Important. If you have clinical evidence of hypoperfusion of vital organs, that auto-regulation kicks in. So an example that I used in each of the other lectures was a number of years ago between baby number one and baby number two, I had a relatively serious miscarriage. And I dropped my hemoglobin from 15.6 to 7.2 in about eight hours. Not ideal. But my, because I was young and healthy, my body knew that I had no mean arterial pressure. I had a blood pressure of about 70 over 40. And so it vasoconstricted, and that's why I was pale and a little bit little bit uh, clammy and could not really stand up very effectively. But the reality is it kept enough oxygen going to my brain and to my heart to keep my body going until I could be treated. So as we consider the body itself, that's what autoregulation does. It clamps down these blood vessels, it shunts the blood to where it needs to go, and it helps you sustain life until we reverse the condition that caused it. So that's the other key factor. We have to address the cause. You can't cure shock. Shock is only a symptom. It's a symptom of something else that has happened. But it's important to understand the physiology behind why these body systems fail, because then you understand what your patient is doing. And I will walk you back through this case study and help you understand why the individuals who were caring for this patient didn't see it. So a couple of things I want to just emphasize. First is aerobic metabolism. That's how our cells work. Those of you that remember those nightmare days in nursing school where we went through Krebs cycle and all those wonderful <laughs> cellular uh, biology lectures, remember that the mitochondria in the cell actually convert ADP to ATP, which is the energy of the cell. Um, it's part of the processes that happen and it's based on oxygen. So oxygen is used to convert ADP to ATP. Very simple, aerobic metabolism. We need oxygen. If we don't get enough oxygen through our circulating blood volume, for whatever reason, we move into anaerobic metabolism. And that means that although our cells are still producing ATP, which we need, it's not producing it efficiently enough. And the process that it uses is going to have a byproduct of pyruvic acid which is converted to lactic acid. Now, when Amy talks a little bit later, I want you to remember lactic acid because it's something we can measure. And so when we measure lactic acid in the bloodstream and those levels begin to rise, it's an indicator that for whatever reason, right, there's lots of reasons, but for whatever reason, our cells are now in an anaerobic metabolic state and that's not healthy. Our body doesn't like anaerobic metabolism. So because we're in that anaerobic state, we're releasing lactic acid in increasing amounts. What does that do to our pH? Well, anyone remember what a normal pH is? Yes, those are my newer graduates, I can tell. 735 or 745? No, you're not. I don't know what an ICU right now. Okay, so 735. 
3.5 to 7.45, and actually the perfect pH is 7.40, so every one of you should have it tattooed on your forehead so that everyone knows my body likes 7.40. We don't like lower, we don't like higher. And so your cells actually thrive at a pH of 7.40. As we get below that, 7.35 is the low end of the cutoff, which we consider the normal range. But when our cells go into anaerobic metabolism and release lactic acid, that causes the actual pH of the body to drop into an acidotic state. 7.3, 7.28, 7.25, I've seen it down in the sixes. Not healthy. The cells don't do well in an acid environment. So here's what gets really interesting. One of the ways that the body, remember how I said if our blood pressure drops, what do my veins do? They constrict, constrict. right? Constrict. They constrict to cause my blood pressure to go back up. Autoregulation. Well, the body also tries to regulate this acid-base imbalance, and if the body detects that my cellular environment is in an acidotic state, it's going to try to raise that by getting rid of acid. And there are two ways it gets rid of acid. One is through the kidneys, but the other one is through the respiratory system. And so what I do is CO2 is an acid, carbon dioxide, and I breathe out CO2. So the body says, huh, got to get rid of some acid. What am I going to do? We need to get rid of CO2. So what does it make me do? It makes me breathe faster and it makes me breathe deeper. So I get rid of CO2. It is a compensatory mechanism. It has to happen. It's not possible that it doesn't happen in the early phases. And therefore, I don't breathe at a rate of 18. It's not possible. I have to breathe at a rate of 26, 28, even 24 to blow off CO2 so that my body starts correcting itself. And this happens very early as my cells go into anaerobic metabolism and as the pH of the body drops below 7.35, I start to breathe more rapidly, faster, and deeper. But we didn't see that documented in this medical record. So I was able to testify in this case that those vital signs were not only wrong, but they weren't possible. And so by discrediting vital signs on a medical record, I discredited the entire medical record because if one thing was falsified, you can't prove that other things weren't falsified. And so that was a very, very valuable lesson for all of the staff at this particular hospital to understand was their medical record was dis, um, disqualified as a valid document simply because you could prove from a physiology standpoint that the respiratory rates were made up in addition to the transition phase of labor thing, which we could document up so many ways with lots of literature to support that you don't sit there and breathe passively. It's not possible. So when we look at this, it's important to understand what happens in our body as we begin to walk into this acidotic state. So the result is you have an imbalance between your oxygen supply and your demand. All right, so the cells needed oxygen, they didn't get it, so now they move into the anaerobic metabolism, causing an acidotic state. And so one of the things we do right off the bat is we put oxygen on the person, but it doesn't address the problem, it puts a Band-Aid on it for a little while. And I say for a little while because what did I say about some of the causes? We are not getting enough circulation back to the cells. So even if you flood that circulation with oxygen, if you're not pumping it through the body, it's not really effective. And we'll talk about why that is. So we know that when oxygen consumption drops below the needs of the cells, then we go into anaerobic metabolism, we release lactic acid, and we become acidotic. The larger that debt becomes, the more oxygen we need that we're not getting, the more serious this shock syndrome progresses. So important. Anaerobic metabolism occurs regardless of the cause. This is a physiologic response to a trigger. So it doesn't matter what the cause of shock is, if it's sepsis, cardiogenic, is it hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, doesn't matter. You're always going to go into anaerobic metabolism, you are always going to get acidotic, 100% of the time. So because we understand that physiology, we can begin to understand the clinical signs and symptoms. But we also know that if we identify the cause and reverse it, we can reverse the entire shock syndrome. So we're going to talk about the systemic effects. What does this mean within the context of the human body? And we'll go through each organ system briefly. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. There are more things on the slides, and you will have access to these. But what we want to do is highlight a couple of the key things. Every body system is affected. So our classic early picture is going to be a patient 
who has changes in levels of consciousness. Now that doesn't mean unconscious. It doesn't mean that they are um, comatose, not initially. It can be just anxiety, but changes in levels of consciousness, changes in their skin, their urine output eventually, and their vital signs, temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure are significant, as well as respiratory rate. And these changes can be very, very subtle. They may not be something that's obvious. Now I gave you one set of vital signs that were pretty obvious, and they did exist, by the way. However, if you looked at the entire picture, you could start looking back. Remember what I said about that Monday morning quarterbacking? You could start looking back and say, wait a minute, I can see, in retrospect, how they missed different, very subtle signs along the way. But the ones I gave you were pretty obvious. Okay? And still no action occurred at that particular time. So in the lungs, one thing I want to highlight is, as we shift into anaerobic metabolism, and we release lactic acid and pyruvic acid, there is damage to the cell membrane. And if you remember your favorite class in microbiology and cellular biology, you remember that the cell membrane keeps things inside the cell and keeps things out of the cell. But if it breaks down, if it's damaged, then we start to see things leaking out of the cell and things leaking into the cell. So it no longer works appropriately. So they'll have electrophysiologic changes in the cell, but you're also gonna have fluid leaking outside the cell. So in the lungs themselves, this is one of the biggest changes that occurs as shock progresses. As those cell walls are damaged, it's all the cell walls in the body. The response to that damage is going to vary with organ system, how rapidly it occurs, but it does occur in every organ system. So in the lungs, as the cell walls and the alveoli become more permeable, fluids leak out, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is less effective, and oh, guess what I already said? We have an oxygen debt, we need more but we're not exchanging it. So one of the things I always like to highlight is the fact that if you give this patient oxygen, which is always a good thing, but at the cellular level, they're not exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide effectively, you're still not treating them as well as you might expect. So it's not uncommon to put oxygen on these patients, see a brief increase in their pulse oximetry, and then they'll go back down and start dipping below. Why? Because the lungs aren't working because you've got cellular changes at the alveolar level that are allowing fluids, a fluid barrier to occur, and so that oxygen and carbon dioxide cannot be exchanged. So they're breathing heavier and faster and faster and faster, and they're not effective. But the body is saying, wait a minute, I am really getting acidotic here. You need to get rid of CO2, so breathe harder. But it's not effective, because now we have fluid pulling in the lungs. So early on, we see rapid and sometimes deep respirations to decrease that CO2. But later on, we have hypoventilation. The patient is exhausted. They can no longer breathe, and we showed you that in our case study. Eventually, she had to be intubated and put on a respirator because she couldn't breathe anymore. She ran out of energy, so her entire pulmonary system failed. When we look at the kidneys, I think one important thing to understand in any type of shock and that is basically volume related, is that the normal kidney blood flow is about 1.3 liters per minute. But in the shock state, it drops to 200 mLs per minute. So that's a significant change in the blood flow to the kidney. So what happens? Well, the kidneys look at this and go, wait a minute, I need 1.3 liters, I'm getting 200 mLs. And so what the kidneys do is they begin to process, how do I shunt more blood to the kidneys? Because we need to work we need to help with this acid-base problem. We also need to get rid of waste products. And so the kidneys are thinking of themselves only. And you'll find that most body systems do think of themselves only, with a few exceptions. And so the kidneys are saying, we're going to release something, which we'll, we'll highlight in a few minutes, but we're going to release something called renin, and it's going to become angiotensin 1, which is going to convert to angiotensin 2, which is then going to be a powerful vasoconstrictor and it's going to cause the blood vessels to constrict and shunt more blood to the kidneys to raise the glomerular filtration rate by increasing the pressure coming into the kidneys. It's a compensatory mechanism. So understand two things. One, that blood volume is going to decrease. Two, the kidneys are going to try to fix it, but they're going to fail. And three, every patient who goes through this will have acute renal failure, they will have renal insult, and it will last about six months to a year. I shared last night that uh, back in January, my sister was in septic shock three times because she just doesn't learn. Um, she's a nurse, by the way, critical care nurse, or she had, um, sadly. But, uh, and she had called me up one day 
when she got her labs back, and she was like, I don't understand why my creatinine is still elevated. I said, duh, you had no blood pressure for two days. Um, and so you have acute renal failure. She said, I do not. I said, you do. And it will go away within six months to a year if you begin to take care of yourself. It's a choice. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But the reality is that most people will have renal failure for about a year. It's acute. It is reversible. So it's not chronic permanent renal failure. But it's something that does occur every time you decrease perfusion to the kidney. So it's very common. Alright, so we talked all about that. Cardiovascular, heart changes. When we look at the heart, we understand that the heart knows also that when we don't have enough blood supply to the heart and to the brain, it's going to try to shunt blood into those directions. Alright, so the body knows that the most important organ in the majority of people is the brain. I've met a few where it's not really that important, but the reality is for most people it is. But we also have to have enough blood supply to the heart for it to pump. So there's a couple of things that go on in the cardiovascular system that are important. One thing is, if you remember, the heart is a pump. And so when we talk about the entire human body, it really is subject to a good functioning cardiovascular system. And we have three components. We have a pump, pipes, and fluid. If any one of those fails, the system itself will not work. And so when we talk about the effects of of other causes on the cardiovascular system, understand that we have to have fluid coming back into the heart. Remember Starling's Law? It says that when we put the fluid back into the ventricles, it stretches those ventricular fibers and forces them to stretch enough so that they contract. If we don't have that stress, it doesn't contract effectively. If the ventricle doesn't contract effectively, we don't pump the blood where it needs to go, including to the brain or to the rest of the body. So we need to have fluid coming back, adequate fluid coming back into the heart to cause the stretch to allow the pump. So that's part of it. We also understand that the heart recognizes that it's not getting enough fluid. It's not pumping well enough. So it starts pumping faster and harder initially until whatever is causing this is not treated and eventually the heart will fail. So some of the compensatory mechanisms that we saw in our case and that you will see are going to be early onset of an increase in pulse and it will be gradual but it will happen and these patients will have a pulse rate of 120, 130, 140, 150 and at one point hers did go up in the 150s to 160s and that was toward the very end before her heart failed. Blood pressures will decrease and so you will see your blood pressure come down, down, down below what your baseline is. Now if you walk around like I do with a blood pressure of 110 to 113 over 70 to 75, then I don't have far to go. So if I have a large volume blood loss, I drop to 70 over 40 very quickly if it's a sudden blood loss. But in someone who walks around, it's very important to recognize if your patient's baseline blood pressure is 160 over 30, their response may be 120 over 60. But that might give you the same physiologic changes in that person because that is significantly below their normal baseline. So you do have to think about this within the context of what your patient's norm is. You're also going to see your mean arterial pressure, which you can hardly see here in this leg, but it'll drop below 60. And so as we calculate the mean arterial pressure, understand that when it goes below 60, that autoregulation no longer works. So now, because our mean arterial pressure is lower, the autoregulation of the blood vessels is not working effectively. So they're not going to constrict and dilate the way they should to maintain that. We have decreased coronary perfusion pressure, and that means that we're not getting enough blood into the heart muscle. So now the heart muscle is not getting the oxygenated blood that it needs, and so it's flipping into anaerobic metabolism. The cell walls are damaged. The electrical conduction system isn't working right. So you're not getting enough of the myocardial fibers that are working effectively because they're not getting oxygenated blood. And so we begin to see signs and symptoms of dysrhythmias. And this patient did have some ventricular tachycardia, a few PVCs, multifocal PVCs, but it was because her heart wall wasn't getting enough oxygen, not because of coronary arteries, but because there wasn't enough volume coming back to her heart. And so instead of looking for a cardiac cause, we should have looked at some other more obvious causes in this patient. There are neurologic changes, and again, secondary to eventually we won't be getting enough oxygenated blood to the brain. And what happens when the brain cells don't get oxygen? Well, they fail, just like any other cells. 
But initially, what we see in our patients are anxiety. And I, I had to chuckle a little bit last night because I asked the group, do you ever have patients that are anxious? And every hand went up and I said, okay. But it's not always anxious for the same reason. So we all have anxious patients, especially when they're facing their first labor, first delivery. There's a lot of unknowns there. But then there's that patient who is anxious. And I have to share with you some of the comments that the nursing staff documented in this patient's medical record. Patient is lazy. Patient doesn't try. Patient complaining excessively. Patient continues to complain. Patient says she has pain. But there was an overtone of, but we don't believe that she really has pain. There were a lot of comments that were inappropriate written by professional nurses that should not have ever found their way into that chart. It, it really is, all it is, is food for lawyers. Trust me, because we used every one of them to discredit the people taking care of her. Because if that's the way you perceive this patient, how observant were you? Because this patient had a serious problem that was not diagnosed appropriately. So the reality is I want you to remember that lesson, and I've always remembered it, and it is a hard lesson to learn. You don't want to learn it the way those nurses did. But the reality is we eventually have intracranial hypertension because the, the blood vessels in the brain will actually clamp down and that will cause an increase in blood pressure in the brain which also causes cellular damage to the brain cells. And so eventually your brain, your vital control centers in your brain that control your heart rate, your blood pressure, your respiratory rate will fail. And so then we get total body failure because our control center no longer works. So early on, our changes are subtle, like we talked about, a little bit of anxiety. Those patients that say to you something bad is about to happen, always listen to that. They may be incorrect, but you don't want to miss it. They might be apathetic. They might say, I just don't know what to do. I don't feel right. Something is wrong. Always, always listen to that. And later on, their level of consciousness will deteriorate. She became confused, a little bit disoriented. What did they document? She's sundowning. She's 35 years old. She is not sundowning. All right? Secondary to narcotics. You think? I don't think so. She didn't have that many narcotics on board. Some of us can function pretty well. When you have significant pain, you may or may not know this, if you truly have significant pain, you can take a very high dose of narcotic and be completely functional because that narcotic goes right to the pain source and not to the side effects as much. So a lot of patients can function on high doses of medication when their pain is significant. Look at a cancer patient. I have seen patients with an oncologic diagnosis who have been on unbelievable amounts of narcotics, who function very well. So I'm not saying that's a blanket statement, but rather something to look at your patient through those eyes. If they're becoming confused, don't blame it on a small dose of Vicodin. I doubt it. It could be, but you want to make sure you're not missing something else. In this case, when she became a little disoriented, they had other words to describe it, and they were inaccurate, and then eventually unresponsive. And at that point, you go, wow, I guess something really is wrong, right? I mean, they, they did at that point, but it was a little bit late. The liver also fails, just like every other organ system. But two things I want to highlight. One of those is, what does the liver do? It detoxifies the blood, so its function is damaged. And when I used to teach, um, I used to teach critical care in an undergraduate program, in a traditional program, and also med surge. Um, but when I taught students, I used to say, you know this stuff, it's not hard. Just know the normal anatomy and physiology of every organ system, the norm, and then all you have to do is say, what happens if it breaks? It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. I mean, it's that simple. You don't have to memorize anything. Just understand the norm. So the liver actually does detoxify the blood. It helps in metabolism. It actually manufactures ATP. So it's not working, so you're not getting any of those benefits. But the other thing the liver does also is it makes clotting factors. And so it no longer is able to make clotting factors. So what happens to these patients as you get further and further along, they are unable to clot their blood. And so now you have that lovely um, dragon called DIC that sets in. And they literally, it's a clotting disorder that results in bleeding as a symptom. So these patients will bleed to death internally over a short period of time, if not reversed. GI, so believe it or not, your GI system is the least important system in your body. And I know that around lunchtime we don't feel that way. But the reality is that when you have a major com um, concern in your body that is impacting the amount of blood volume that's circulating, one of the first organ systems to be um, affected is the GI system. 
because your body knows that it is the least important, so it shunts the blood away from it to the other more vital organs. Makes sense. But guess what? One of the early subtle signs and symptoms you will see is hypoactive bowel sense. These patients will have no appetite. They will say, I'm a little bit nauseous. I don't feel like eating. Nothing sounds good. And you put a stethoscope on their abdomen, and guess what? They're not, they, they don't have any bowel sounds. So that tells you that for whatever reason, the body is shunting blood away from the GI tract, and you might want to look at why that is. So very, very early signs. So slow increase in respiratory rate, rapid and deep initially, and hypoactive bowel sounds are two of your earliest, and anxiety, three of your earliest clinical signs and symptoms that something is wrong. So these patients eventually will develop gastric ulcers or stress ulcers, but one other thing that happens is, remember we talked about that cell membrane that breaks down because of all the anaerobic metabolism? Well, the bacteria, the good bacteria in the gut, leaks out. And so they develop massive peritonitis. So they have third spacing of abdominal fluid. They develop what looks like a pregnant abdomen in a non-pregnant patient, all full of fluid and bacteria. And so they will develop a massive infection. We have some hematologic changes that also occur at the same time. Again, your hematologic system. Uh, clotting factors are a big one that are not produced effectively, and so again, it contributes to the DIC. Leukopenia also occurs. This is bad if you have an infection. And so because of the changes to the hematologic system, to the bone marrow, that doesn't produce white blood cells as effectively. There are neuroendocrine responses as well, and a couple that I always like to highlight, the first one is that fight or flight response. So your neuroendocrine system will release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Why? Those are going to increase your heart rate, they're going to vasoconstrict your blood vessels, they're going to raise your blood pressure. It is a response to a trigger. So the brain gets told there's not enough circulating volume, don't know why, don't care why, but it's not working for me right now. Release these substances so we raise the heart rate and we raise the blood pressure. And you know, we can infuse these or inject them in patients that need that immediate push to improve their blood pressure, but it's not something you can sustain life on for a long period of time. So we call it the fight or flight response, and it's meant as a quick fix, so that's one of the triggers. The other one is the release of some other mediators that also help to increase our blood volume, and that is ADH is released. And when ADH is released, um, Anti-diuretic hormone, the way to remember this, I know some of you are going, oh, I hated those hormones. Well, it's not so hard, really. ADH, anti-diuretic. Anti-diuretic means I do not pee. So it's the opposite. So if I don't pee, I retain water. And that's exactly what ADH does. When we release ADH, it causes us to retain water, build up our fluid volume, and increase the volume coming back to the heart so that it pumps better. It's merely a feedback mechanism. Important to understand that that happens. So the skin changes also occur, and initially, because we are now clamping down everything, initially, sending it back to the heart, we have skin that is cool, pale, and clammy. Then those systems fail, we have massive vasodilation, we become pink, red, warm to the touch, and you know what normally happens? People go in and say, oh, you look so much better, because cool, pale, and clammy looked bad. But now that you're pink and warm, I'm happy. You shouldn't be happy, trust me. It's just a ne it's the next phase before you get to cold, cool, cyanotic, and mottled, which we know is bad. So when you see the early signs, which is pale, cool, and moist, and they all of a sudden get to a little bit flushed, red, and warm, you should know that the next one to come is cool, cyanotic, and mottled. All right, so that is the progression in the integumentary system. So the immune system is also affected, so if you have an underlying infection, they will not respond to that as effectively. So we're going to talk about three classifications. That's one of your objectives. There are three easy ones. Hypovolemic, all right, lack of fluid. Cardiogenic, pump doesn't work. Distributed, pipes are too big. Okay, so three easy classifications. And distributive shock has three types, anaphylaxis, neurogenic, and septic. When we look at hypovolemic, very quickly, loss of blood volume. You all know this one. You've been in situations where you've seen it. Rapid loss of blood volume, not enough fluid in the pipes. And so what do we have to do? We have to stop the blood loss and we have to replace the fluid. 
I think it's interesting to know that your symptoms appear when you drop your blood volume by 15 to 20 percent over a short period of time. That's really important to understand. So if someone's losing blood in the postpartum period rapidly, they're going to become symptomatic as they drop their blood volume down around 15 to 20 percent. So if the average woman is between 6 liters and 6.5 liters of blood in their body and they lose a liter, it's getting close to the 15%. If they lose 1,500, you're almost at 20, you're around 20. So at a liter to 15%, so if you don't know that that patient is bleeding, but you look at their clinical signs and symptoms and you start to see the tachycardia and the low blood pressure, you can automatically assume that somehow they've lost about a liter to 1,500 cc's of blood because that's when the symptoms appear. If they're not symptomatic, they probably haven't lost that much. There may be something else going on. So you want to use this in a differential diagnosis way. The other thing to recognize, too, is if the blood loss occurs over a long period of time, so we have someone who um, is a renal patient, and they don't produce enough erythropoietin, they don't make hemoglobin, so they don't transport enough oxygen, eventually their blood volume goes down, they can come in with a hemoglobin of two. Not good. But it may happen over a year. And they will walk into the emergency room, pale, but Still absolutely walking. upright. All right, so you, you have to look at the time that occurred. So in this particular case, we're going to talk about a different cause, but I think all of those are important. So the causes of hypovolemic shock can vary. It can be uh, nausea, vomiting, any kind of fluid loss. Um, in your cases, it'll be usually hemorrhagic fluid loss. All right, but it can occur from different things. But again, not enough fluid, doesn't fill up the, the pump, can't pump effectively, doesn't get oxygenated blood to the rest of the body system. Another couple of tidbits are, in some patients, you'll see a more rapid, it might be 10% volume loss. So for instance, in a patient like um, an elderly person, or in a neonate, or a sick infant, you might see a lower volume loss. Uh, you might have some high-risk pregnant women who have underlying health conditions that make them higher risk for a lower volume loss. So your collaborative management, what do you do? You correct the problem, replace the fluids, buy them some time, and allow them to get better. So very simple, correct the problem number one as you are managing the symptoms. We look at cardiogenic real quick. This is pump failure, usually from a cardiac event. So when we talk about the patient that I gave you the picture of, yes, her pump failed, but it failed for other reasons. It failed because it didn't have enough oxygenated blood coming into it for a long period of time, 72 hours to be exact. But the reality is cardiogenic, true cardiogenic shock, is from usually a myocardial infarction or an injury to the heart of some sort. There are a couple of different causes. And how do we treat that? Normally the way we treat it is we rest the heart. So we have external devices like an intraortic balloon pump. We also have things like an impella, which allow us to replace the pump for a short period of time. Now because it's six months to a year um, with external and internal devices that actually help us rest the heart so that it can get better or it can be replaced now through transplant. So our technology has become very sophisticated. If we have a cardiogenic reason for heart failure, and this patient was put on a balloon pump, um, you know, when you get to the point where there's nothing else you can do, you might as well try that. It was not effective because that's not why her heart failed. But the reality is that you want to consider cardiogenic causes in some patients, rarely your patients, right? It could happen, but it's rare. So distributive shock is the one I want, to, I want to close with as far as the actual physiology and then we'll give you an update on our case and what actually happened. Um, this occurs when the blood vessels dilate massively throughout the body without an increase in volume. So we have 6 liters of blood in our body or 6.5 liters and all of our blood vessels become dilated to the size that they would need 9 liters to fill them up. But I only have 6. So what does that mean? Well, it means the blood kind of sits out in the periphery, doesn't have anywhere to go, it just pools. And so we no longer have volume coming back to our heart, which will result in heart failure very quickly. We don't have enough volume coming back, the heart's not pumping effectively, so we don't get that volume to the brain, to the kidneys, to the gut, to the endocrine system, to the liver. So basically all these systems fail because of distribution. We have to, and all of our other compensatory mechanisms have failed as well. So we have to get these vessels either filled up or clamped down, whichever works better. In her case, they tried to clamp them down with medications. What they needed to do was fill them up with fluid. And so it's not blood loss, it's volume that they need.
but you also have to treat the cause. So we, we talked about the decreased venous return to the heart so that the ventricles don't fill up so they can't pump effectively. And that leads to tissue hypoxia and cell death. We have three types of distributive shock. Anaphylactic, this is where you have an allergic reaction. And so with anaphylactic shock, your allergic reaction releases cell mediators, enzymes that actually act on the walls of the vessels causing massive vasodilation, as well as laryngeal edema, swelling of the airway, bronchospasm. This is very difficult to correct. You have to reverse the process in order to treat the patient. You can see this. And I want you all to remember this, if a patient has an allergic reaction to a medication that they didn't know they were allergic to and you didn't know they were allergic to, you have to reverse the process and that's why we give the patient epinephrine because it helps to counteract that process. Obviously stop the med, remove it, get it away from them, whatever it is. But you have to identify what caused this anaphylactic reaction. We had a situation in Alaska that was really interesting. Um, we had a number of patients and staff members who were highly allergic, one staff member in particular, to lilies, and in particular a certain type of lily. We actually had an agreement with every florist in Anchorage not to put those lilies in any flower arrangement that came to the hospital, ever. And the reason was we had admitted that nurse three times to our emergency room in anaphylactic shock and intubated her and had her in our ICU several times. And she only had, it, it could, have, could have been on the floor, down the hallway, and if she walked onto that floor she had an immediate allergic reaction. So it's possible to have severe anaphylaxis to something that you wouldn't normally expect. So an important question to ask is, do you have any allergies to anything? You know, there's sensitivity to dust, which we all have to a certain extent, but then there's true anaphylaxis. So really important, and if you have a patient who goes into this, you want to look at your environment and ask the patient, make sure you understand what, what happened, but you do have to reverse this process. You can't just give them oxygen because their bronchospasm, their larynx is swelling. You can't get the oxygen in. Neurogenic shock is routinely caused by spinal cord injury. You did have a patient not too long ago, maybe a year and a half ago, who had a spinal cord injury from an abscess, um, which did cause some neurogenic issues. She was an interesting patient. I worked with that one for a while. But the reality is what happens is the messages from the brain are no longer able to help regulate the blood vessels. So it's distributive because the blood vessels dilate and the message from the brain from the sympathetic nervous system that says, oops, you need to constrict, can't get through. And so the parasympathetic condition, which is bradycardia, massive vasodilation, is unopposed and you don't have that sympathetic tract in place. It usually happens at spinal cord injuries that are above the thoracic level and it usually is transient. It can happen within an hour of a spinal cord injury, lasts for a few days, sometimes a few weeks, depending on the severity. We tend to treat it with one, symptomatically, we're gonna keep those vessels filled up if we can't vasoconstrict them. We may use some medications if we can get it to work, but we're also going to use some medications to try to decrease the swelling of the spinal cord and allow those tracts to heal a little bit. We talked about clinical manifestations are about the same. So septic shock is the final one I want to focus on a little bit. Septic shock occurs, it's an inflammatory response to an invading microorganism. And when we have invading microorganisms, a lot of times our bodies fight them off, but sometimes they don't. And if your body does not fight it off effectively, those microorganisms begin to take over and they release endotoxins and exotoxins. And the endotoxins and exotoxins are extremely um, effective at vasodilating. So the infection itself releases enzymes, toxins, that vasodilate massively. So the classic picture of someone in septic shock or someone who has sepsis or a body, a system-wide infection is that their uh, vessels vasodilate. Their blood pressure drops, their heart rate goes up, and eventually it, it never responds to anything. So the initial treatment of sepsis is oftentimes fluid massive fluids, sometimes two to three liters over the first hour, sometimes more than that, of just fluid to fill up the vessels so that we can get some cardiac output going. Remember, they haven't lost any blood. They just have all of their blood pulling in the periphery. So they need nine liters, they have six, and we have to fill up those pipes. So it is a systemic response to a massive infection. And that is what the end diagnosis was for this patient. She was having a systemic response to a massive infection that had not been identified. So early on, you're going to see the same symptoms we've talked about. You're going to see symptoms of 
sympathetic stimulation, elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate as we blow off CO2 up to 24, 26, or 28, very important number to look at. You're going to see hypoactive bowel sounds. You're going to see anxiety from the brain cells not getting enough oxygen. You're going to have peripheral pulses that are weak and thready, a little bit more difficult to palpate. You're going to see a difference in your patient. You're going to know that it's different away from their baseline. Her blood pressure was 96 over 60. Her heart rate was 135. And again, I adjusted those numbers a little bit. But the reality is she was hypotensive and she was tachycardic. Don't know what her respiratory rate is. Never could figure that out. But I do know it wasn't 18. All right, but the reality is her temp was 101.5 on Tylenol, which means it was higher. So all of those clinical signs and symptoms point clearly to an infection. Later on, when the body can't meet its oxygen needs, you're going to have a decrease in cardiac output with severe hypotension that happened to her. You're going to have weak, rapid, ready pulses, hypothermia eventually in the later phases. The body can't maintain its temp anymore. You have no white blood cell count left. So early on, your white blood cells, had they been measured, had that CBC been done on day one and that night, it would have probably been 20 to 30,000. But since we didn't have that information, we couldn't measure it. But when they did finally get a CBC on that cardiac cath table, there were 2,000. She had no white blood cells left. All right, so they had all gone to the source of the infection and been eaten up at that point because all of her body systems had failed. Hypothermic, cold, clammy, mottled skin. We made it through all three. So she was pale, diaphoretic at first, and then she got warm and, and pink, and they went, oh, good, she's better. Wrong. She ended up mottled and multiple organ failure, which is obvious. So the body compensates, and we already talked about this. Just as this illness or injury triggers all of these systems, we see compensation. Vasoconstriction, so it helps get your blood pressure up a little bit. Fluids start to shift from the tissues to the vascular bed. That increased respiratory rate is significant. But eventually, you're going to lose that. And we talked about the GI tract and the chemo and the uh, renal system. So two things I like to mention, and you all are especially understanding of this. So we have chemo receptors and baroreceptors in our neck, so in the carotid bodies that are located in the neck. And we used to, years ago in ICU, we used to put patients in Trendelenburg when their blood pressure went down. And we stopped doing that. And that was because we put them in Trendelenburg and their blood pressure would go up. Well, of course it would because we stopped triggering those because all of a sudden they felt, oh, they had already responded, vasoconstricted, the blood pressure went up nicely. And then real quickly when those mechanisms stopped working, the blood pressure plummeted again even though they were still in Trendelenburg. So we learned to raise the feet and send the blood back to the heart, but not to not to dip them into Drindelberg, but you do that with some of your preterm labor patients still at times. And so remembering that those carotid bodies and the chemoreceptors and baroreceptors are going to identify decreased oxygen, increased CO2 in the blood, so that's the chemoreceptors, and the baroreceptors identify changes in pressure. So they also will send messages to the brain to vasoconstrict, but they will fail eventually. So as we have this massive pooling in the periphery, those also fail. We talked about the kidneys releasing angiotensin II, which will also uh, vasoconstrict. We also have the pancreas, and when it doesn't get enough oxygenated blood, it releases something called MDF, myocardial depressant factor, which actually depresses the pumping action of the heart. Not good, <laughs> right? So our heart's already failing, and now we're gonna depress it even more, so not a good thing. So early on, we have our hyperdynamic phase. This is when all of those systems kick in and try to correct it, but later on, we have hypodynamic with progressive tissue hypoxia, progressive decreased cardiac output, increasing acidosis as the blood pools in the capillaries, and then lactic acidosis, which will continue to cause an increase in the permeability of the cell wall with fluids leaking out. And it, you can see how it just spirals more and more rapidly as this progression. And it, this is where we end up. Because septic shock in and of itself has a mortality rate of 95 to 98%. Right, if not recognized. And if you're in the progressive phase of septic shock, you are more than likely going to die. Right, progressive phase. You need to identify the cause and treat it. So this was our patient early on. She was restless. We, we believe she had an elevated respiratory rate, but we don't know that for sure. Um, she was tachycardic. She had a widening pulse pressure, and this is something you can always do as a Monday morning quarterback. You take a look at those blood pressures that are done every four hours, and you look at them and they go something like this, 140 over 80. 130 over 70, 132 over 60, 128 over 50, 
124 over 48. Now, all by themselves, each one of those numbers would probably not get your attention, but if you look at them over time, what you see is there is a gradual widening of the pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. And when you look back at a patient who's gotten very sick and been going into the shock syndrome, you will see that 100% of the time. Very, very difficult to pick up on it, but if you're a nurse caring for a patient and something's wrong, you might want to look back over 24 hours and see if you see that trend because it is an early warning sign of changes. So progressively these patients are restless, they're anxious, they're in, sometimes they'll complain of pain, they're weak, they're fatigued, they have cold, clammy skin. And you look at this patient and they look sick. Mm -hmm. right? She looks sick, but they, they um, labeled her as a patient who was a complainer, someone who wasn't trying very hard. They labeled her as fat and lazy in the medical record. Um, you know, not okay, because they missed all of it. So later on, you're going to lose your blood pressure, rapid shallow respirations, finally culminating in requiring intubation, nausea, vomiting, no urinary output, and hypoactive bowel sounds. But remember, the goal of your treatment is to identify the cause of treatment. And so as we look at what we're going to do, we're going to airway, breathing, circulation, look at those clinical manifestations, treat the symptoms, but identify the cause and treat that effectively. So let's return to our case and give you the summary. This patient had a very unusual diagnosis. On post-mortem examination, they found that she had a group A beta strep um, infection of her pelvis. It was never diagnosed. She had no symptoms prior. There was no reason to suspect that as a diagnosis, but that is what she had. However, there were clinical signs and symptoms over the 72 hours of her hospitalization that were clearly indicative of sepsis, had they picked up on them. Had they done a CBC on day one to identify if the hemoglobin was normal, let's do a CBC and see if anything else shows up. Let's look at our other body symptoms, but systems, but you know, in, in an area like the Family Maternity Center, in your antepartum, postpartum, labor and delivery areas, you're mostly dealing with healthy women. I almost said patients, but I went, it is women. Um, healthy women. And so, in reality, you're not looking for someone who's this sick. She didn't come in looking that sick, but she very quickly became sick, and we didn't have a good differential diagnosis. But I do challenge you, even if she had a separated symphysis pubis that was diagnosed on radiologic exam, those clinical signs and symptoms did not go with that. Would not have caused a temperature that would have been that high. So there were other pieces of information, plus the missing respiratory rates that we, couldn't, we could not look at. And when they finally did the CBC, we saw that all of her white blood cell count was, were essentially gone. She didn't have anything left to fight with. And she did die later that same day that she was cardiac cath. She cardiac arrested twice, unsuccessful on the second attempt, um, and left behind a husband and four children, including a newborn baby. So had this been diagnosed on day one and treated, there is no doubt in my mind this woman would have survived. So again, emphasizing the importance of being vigilant, of looking at all of the clinical signs and symptoms. Um, years ago at AACN, at the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, we created a program called CSI, off the TV show, mm -hmm. and, and I try to remember, it, it was a clinical science in, or clinical skills institute. It was something of critical skills, critical analysis. It was looking at cases like this and identifying the key points that you have to remember and identifying how you become that detective and determine what's wrong with my patient. So really good activity. It's been a pleasure being here today. I appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. And Please feel free to ask for copies of these slides, and now you have it of recording. So please complete your evaluations. I'll collect them, and we will put this in your health stream. You'll get a certificate as well, and we'll put this in health stream over the next couple of weeks.